Wow, wow, we back at it. Happy New Year to everybody. Super 5, Xavier Porter, host, co-host Pat DeMoss. Um, happy to be back. How you feeling, Pat? I am feeling great. How are you feeling, X? I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited that we're back on. You know, we've been taking care of a lot of business outside of the podcast, but, you know, we're back up and running. we got a lot of things going on that's been taking place between both the world of mixed martial arts and the world of um, boxing. Um, last night we had two great cards, especially one in, um, over there in Vegas with Manny Pacquiao and Adrian Broner. Um, we also had a, a pretty good card with USC at the Barclays Center um, yesterday. And yes, Conor sir. McGregor apparently was challenged. Uh, Pat, tell us about the card last night. Yeah, so ESPN launched their UFC first or first fight night for US or for ESPN, and it's on their platform called ESPN Plus. And pretty much, if uh, if you watched the UFC, you know, last year and prior years, since I believe 2012 or 2013, UFC did a, a deal with Fox, and that expired in 2019. ESPN picked up UFC, and now we have a new wave pretty much for MMA. Uh, 568,000 purchases for ESPN subscription were bought on Friday and Saturday, um, you oh, know, goodness. mainly contributed to the UFC fight, <clears throat> the UFC fight night. Um, I'm not quite for sure because I was not personally able to uh, watch it on television. I found a live stream, uh, but I was kind of busy yesterday doing stuff, so I couldn't, you know, see. But I believe they're doing free ESPN prelims, and then when the main card goes, it goes to ESPN Plus. I believe that's the way they're doing it. Uh, it was the highest rated prelim since at least 2013. Uh, that's insane. And it was a good card. Don't get me wrong. For a fight night, this was an insane card. Um, there was just a lot of things that happened um, and a lot of fights that took place that were, you know, pay-per-view worthy, certainly. But, you know, if you're, if you're kicking off uh, on a new platform, you definitely want to have a good card. Um, pretty much, though, the fights themselves, I mean, crazy. Um, like you said, Conor McGregor was called out, and that actually could be a high possibility. Um, Glover Check's chair looked great. So let me just go ahead and start by saying in the prelims, uh, what I really want to touch on is Donald Cerny versus Alex Hernandez. This fight took place uh, in the lightweight division. This is Cerny's return to lightweight against a young, young up-and-comer who's looked strong. He has looked strong throughout his UFC run. And a lot of people thought that Hernandez was going to run through Cerrone, uh, youth, athleticism, all that was going to play a, a factor into it. However, I mean, Cerrone showed why he truly is one of the best strikers in the world. Uh, beautiful setup, combinations, shots of the body, and uh, leading up the shots to the head. I mean, it was a beautiful TKO. I mean, it was a masterpiece to watch. Uh, and then afterwards, he called out Conor McGregor, as, as anyone would do who wants to fight in the lightweight division. However, Conor responded saying he would fight him. Uh, he said, congratulations, I would, I would fight you now after that performance. So certainly this has been a fight that's been rumored last month, uh, but now with Cerny getting such a dominant win, uh, this could come to fruition. I don't know, don't know really how much sense it makes in terms of rankings, but, I mean, when the hell has, it, has rankings matter in the UFC in the past two years? So I guess for a fan fight, that, that's, a fan, that's, a fan, that's a fantastic fight. So, you know, I'm not going to be disappointed if that fight happens. Um, because I don't want to see Conor fight Khabib right now. And that's a good fight. If Conor wants to seriously come back on track and not just be this one-off prize fighter that, you know, appears once in a blue moon to get a huge paycheck and shock everybody, uh, if he actually wants to, you know, come back and do three, four fights a year, this is a good place for him to start. Uh, the main card, we saw Paige Van Zant get a nice submission win over uh, Rachel Ostevic. Uh, that was a kind of a Come from the back win because Rachel was doing very well throughout that fight. Glover Teixeira looked impressive over Carl Robertson, um, so that's a great submission win for him in the first round. Joseph Benavidez again, a uh, very technical fight from Joseph Benavidez, who just again outsmarted Dustin Ortiz in that fight. He's one of the smartest fighters I've ever seen inside the cage, and he's very underrated. Um, and he has a win over Henry Cejudo, who just beat Tijolish on the main event, which we'll get to here in a second. Uh, Greg Hardy, <laughs> what an interesting turn of events that was. Um, I don't know if you knew X, the, you know Greg Hardy, the former NFL player? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, a lot of con- a lot of controversy with him, right? You know, the domestic abuse. Um, and I got to say something. I've seen a lot of these journalists um, really just, just say he doesn't belong here. And, like, you know, I'm not supporting, you know, domestic violence in no aspect, right? I mean, that, that is seriously, you know, one of the most frowned upon things in our society, and it's terrible. However, um, you know, a lot of people, and I mean, you're, no one's going to go through life making – you know, no mistakes. So I think, you know, not giving someone a second chance to rebirth themselves in a career is a little, little, little absurd, I guess, because we've seen a lot of guys go through a lot of, a lot of different stuff in their careers and bounce back with, you know, people kind of brushing it off. If Greg Hardy, for some reason, you know, is not brushing this off. And he's owned up to it, right? He's, you know, publicly apologized and all these different sorts of things. Um, but it's just interesting how, you know, that aspect, you know, he's getting all this hate, which, you know, I understand, right? You know, domestic, domestic violence is nothing to um, joke around about. It's not to be taken lightly. And I can see where these guys are coming from. Uh, but to say that he shouldn't be on a UFC card, but they were fine with him fighting in the contender series, I, I don't know. Just a little odd, you know, a little hypocritical, I guess, from some yeah. journalists. But uh, he got a disqualification, uh, illegal knee. Um, you know, it happens when you only have, you know, that was his fourth pro fight. So not a whole lot going on there. But what, what do you think about the whole uh, Greg Hardy uh, thing? It's, it's an interesting topic, I guess, to talk about. I, uh, <laughs> I don't <laughs> it's know. Tricky, like, tricky you know, case. I mean, he's, it, it is. You know, it's, it's a sad situation. You know, he got this. And, and any time someone gets accused of domestic violence or actually takes part in domestic violence, they, you know, they have this cloud that's forever hanging over them. And mm-hmm. it's like they can't never get past that. Um, I'm not excusing him. I'm not, you know, knocking him. Um, I just think, you know, maybe we need to look deeper to the situation or let the proper authorities deal with the situation. I mean, I don't know. He's moved on from football to UFC. Dana White doesn't seem to have a problem with it. The powers that be at UFC don't seem to have a problem with it, and they allowed him to participate in the event. So, you know, at this point, I, w- I would like to see the man try to redeem himself some way, somehow. He has the opportunity to do so. So, you know, just like just like in football. You know, you got a lot of guys in football who get caught and, and involved in domestic violence uh, issues, and we never see them again. <laughs> you know, we never hear about them. We never see them. We never hear about them again. They immediately are gone. So this, and, and I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that's the case that happened with Greg Hardy. I think he elected to leave football to go into the UFC, even with the situation. I think he'd probably still be able to play play football. You know. Yeah, absolutely. What about but what about that knee? Do you feel? What about the knee though? Do you feel like that knee was a uh, Rewarded a disqualification? You know, it, it was really tricky because I feel like Crowder was getting up, and he was. I think it just the timing was just at that exact yeah. moment to be deemed illegal. Um, yeah. It's just one of those odd, odd, odd situations. Um, but from a fighting aspect itself, I believe Greg Hardy does belong in the UFC. I mean, obviously he's a tremendous athlete. You know, compete at the NFL. Um, the way he moves is excellent. So I'm excited to see more from him. Um, he just needs, you know, to develop a lot, you know. You can't just jump into gotcha. anything and just be, you know, an experienced pro. So, you know, I think Greg Hardy has a good future in MMA, but, you know, uh, we'll see where, where Dana White and the UFC put him next. It'll be interesting. And uh, something to point out, Rachel uh, Ostrovich, I believe is her last name, Ostovich, yeah, her boyfriend actually had a domestic violence – or her husband, uh, I'm sorry – had an domestic yeah. case uh, against her on this card. And there's a lot of controversy putting Greg Hardy on this card with her. Now, I personally don't believe there's no ill intention there from the UFC. I think it's just how these fights lined up that were like, uh, you know, like looking at the UFC, what, you know, what the hell are you doing? You're putting Greg Hardy on this card with a woman who just went through a domestic violence uh, case. So, you know, I think that's where a lot of it stemmed from, from this, you know, kind of getting rebirthed in Hardy's, Hardy's life, but, you know, we'll see where he goes from there, and especially um, as a social influence, too, as well. But moving on from that, we have the main event, uh, Henry Cejudo and TJ Dillashaw. Oh, man. Oh, man. 
it's God, like, what I, happened? I, what happened in that fight? <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing okay. was T.J. Dillon show. That's all I kept hearing about. Next thing I know, 47 seconds later, it's over. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> God. I, I'm I, I'm a TJ Dillashaw fan. I love his style. Uh, you know, I'm just a huge fan of strikers in general. I always have been. So TJ Dillashaw is someone I look at as a very elite level striker. I don't know if it was the weight cut X from 135 to 125. He says it wasn't. Mm-hmm. If it was, I don't know what the case was. Um, TJ Dillashaw was furious at this stoppage. Now, anyone who didn't watch the fight and they're listening, TJ Dillashaw got TKO. Uh, I want to say 30, 32 seconds into the first round, something like that. Um, he got caught with an odd kick, kind of stumbled him. I think Cejudo followed up with a nice right hand, clipped him, dropped him. They scrambled. Cejudo landed some good, clean shots. But TJ seemed like he was still there going in on a single, and the fight was called off. Now, this referee is no Herb Dean. Uh, it was something McDonald, I believe. He's kind of a uh, – I don't want to say no name, no disrespect to him, but he's not, you know, he's not a well-known MMA referee. And to put him in there against in a super fight, uh, I had to agree on, with Dana White on this. The New York you know, Athletic State Commission has to be a little bit ashamed of that. To not put an experienced ref in there with two champions, you know, world champions of the UFC – it's a little puzzling to me. And I, I, I do personally believe the stoppage was early, but I don't think um, TJ would have really got out of that first round. He just seemed to get – he was a little bit too touchy on his chin, right? He's, every time he got hit, it was a little – you're like, oof, you're kind of holding your breath. Like, uh-oh, uh-oh. It's, you know, uh, I think they are going to do a rematch. Dana White seemed pretty mad at that stoppage as well. Here's the Huda look great. Um, I don't think they're going to do the rematch at 125. That weight cut just seemed brutal for TJ. He looks great. Like, he looked in shape, but he just, he just looked too, too, too skinny. I mean, he just, I mean, I think he's like 5% body fat, X, something like that. Um, and, you know, I'm not a sports scientist or anything like that, but I, I think 5% body fat is a little bit too low to compete at your maximum level. Again, that could be wrong, but I, I, I feel like 9%, you know, 8 9% is a little bit more ideal. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, I think they're going to do the rematch at one one thirty five for sure. Overall, great card though. Um, a lot of good fights, um, and a great way to start off the ESPN Plus deal. So overall, good night for the UFC. Great night actually. Brought in a lot of money, and uh, you know there was one one positive step for the UFC in twenty nineteen after a lackluster twenty eighteen. It's definitely to kick the year off with that kind of card. Before we move forward, let me get your thoughts on uh, Amanda Nunes and Chris Cyborg and John Jones and Mr. Gustafson. Yeah, 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 you know. We have missed a lot here recently. Um, but, yeah, to touch on that, Amanda Nunez is an animal. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> do that to Cyborg? Are you kidding me? I. I literally, I think my jaw fell off in my face. I mean, I was watching these fights live, right? And I, I knew Amanda Nunes was tough, right? I didn't, I didn't think she was going to get, you know, quote unquote, cyborg, as you know, a lot of people thought. I didn't think she was going to get ran through immediately. Um, I thought just the pressure and the volume would have, would have eventually be too much in the third, fourth round, and she, you know, tie her out. Um, was not expecting that at all. Just absolutely rushed cyborg, and I mean, just absolutely clipped her. You know, I mean, that overhand was just vicious. I mean, put her out. We don't see not, you know, we don't see those kind of knockouts in women's MMA. That was just, I mean, that did world of wonders, honestly, I think, for women's mixed martial arts to get it on that next level. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Nunez. Fan. I think a lot of people that weren't familiar with her are definitely familiar with her now. Um, and to put on that kind of performance is just uh, is just insane, you know. It's, <laughs> just I wow, I mean, that that was a that was a bomb. And for the John Jones fight, um, you know, listen, this picogram stuff, man, and all this steroid talk, it's just it confuses me. I've 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 I've, I've done our, you know I've done a lot of research on this stuff too. I mean, I 
genuinely curious of you know, what is going on here. And, you know, at the end of the day, you can't firmly say John Jones is a corrupt cheater and you can't say he's a clean fighter. You, you can't say either because there's just so many question marks in the air around John Jones. Um, I think he's in the best course of action right now, taking his next fight against Anthony Smith and just, just getting on a roll because that's what he needs to do. He, right, he just needs to pump out these fights every two to three months, something like that, yeah. to get people, you know, he can't show up every nine months every year fight and then, you know, test positive, you know, three months later. Like yeah. that, he, if he pops one more time, I mean, I said this the last time, though, too. If he pops he's again, go. man, he's got to go. He's got to go, right? <laughs> and I'm a huge John Jones fan, right? I love watching the fight. His fight against Gustafson was so good, right? He looks great in there, right? I, I, I mean, someone, someone said he looked slow and his timing looked off, and I, I completely disagree. I thought he looked great in there. Uh, granted, I don't think he was in the best shape of his life because, um, uh-huh. you know, he took a lot of time off of training. Uh, but that just goes to show you how good John Jones really is. If he didn't, you know, have a, you know, he wasn't in the best shape of his life and didn't have a whole bunch of training leading up to that fight. He did that against Gustafson, who's t- top two and definitely top two in the lightweight heavyweight division right now, top three, uh, with DC thrown in there. I mean, just, wow. He's leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of people. I personally want to see him fight DC at heavyweight, um, mm-hmm. but I think he knows that's a bad fight for him because DC at heavyweight, yeah, you're not going to be able to throw that guy around. That is a block. That is a brick you're not going to be able to move. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people are. So uh, maybe he'll take that fight after uh, Anthony Smith because past Anthony Smith, but we'll see. But like I said, John Jones, the best course of action for him right now is to just keep racking up fights. Let me propose this to you because a lot, there's been talk that he's looking to maybe step into the boxer world to face some of these top heavyweight fighters and champions, would you give him? Would you say John Jones has a has a shot at becoming a great boxer? Absolutely, absolutely. That's a great point. Wow. John Jones has an eighty four inch reach, um, and you know, I, I first to say he uses a lot of his body in MMA, elbows, knees, kicks, everything. Right? He uses everything. Takedowns. He's a great wrestler. He's, he's a complete mixed martial artist. But he's so talented, right, and moves so well. You can't argue that 84-inch reach is just – what I mean, at 6'4", 84-inch reach, that is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I'm saying this off the top of my head, X. I believe Deontay Wilder's reach is 82 inches, and he's 6'8". Um, I'm not quite sure, but just to put that in comparison for you, right, John Jones is two more inches on Deontay Wilder, maybe one or, you know, one or two. That, that's crazy, and he's four or five inches shorter. So I think he would do well. I, I, I'm not saying throw him in against Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury, people like that. Um, but I, I think you give him enough time, and I think he does develop as a great boxer. What do you think? Okay. I say no, but I, I but you you made some good points. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not getting you know. Boxing is one of those things that it's just. You can't, you can't just naturally get in there, right? You know, they call it a sweet science for a reason. Just like, just like MMA, you just can't jump in the, in the cage or octagon and think because you're a talented athlete that you go put people in all balls and choke people out and do anything else that comes with the sport. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you mentioned, it takes, it would, it would take time. Like you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't think, I don't want to see a John Jones versus Deontay Wilder tomorrow. No, that would be, that'd be murder. I don't want to see that. Um, and I don't think John Jones. Should oh well, actually I take that back. John Jones and Deontay Wilder probably are the same weight, so I guess that would be their fight. But you know it's interesting. It's speculation to say the least. But um, who knows, man? If John Jones gets on a winning streak in 2019, he could be a bigger superstar than he is now, and he could be fighting Deontay Wilder this December. We have no idea what could happen. The sport, these sports are just they're insane. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right because we we, we 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 you know talked about Conor McGregor and and um, Floyd Mayweather for years, and then the fight actually took place. So yeah, you you never know what 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 can happen between both um, both fighting styles and disciplines. You never know; it could be a crossover fight where John Jones steps into the ring and fights a triple. I mean, fights a, um, a Deontay Wilder or 
Anthony Joshua for a top dollar amount of money. So, yeah, you never know what can happen in the future. Oh, yeah, boxing and maybe. Bellator. Let me check real quick. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's cool. going to be a great card. Um, that that also have uh, does that also have Bader and uh, Fedor? Is that on the same card? I think I think Matt Mitrione's on that card. I could be wrong though. I know I know Bader and um, Bader and Fedor are playing on fighting at Belto two fourteen, I believe. Um, okay. Don't know if it's the same card, but yeah, the, the, to get to your point, uh, MVP. And Paul Daly, this fight has been brewing up for whew, quite quite some time. Uh, I feel like it's been two years, and maybe a year and a half. Uh, to say the least, this fight has been um, in Bellator's mind for quite some time, and I'm glad it's finally happening. Uh, I, I think MVP gets the win, though. Um, okay. You know, Paul Daly. Paul Daly has heavy hands. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a good complete fighter, but in, I mean, Michael Van Page is just he's an animal, and I, I compare him to um, <laughs> Israel Yasada right now in the UFC. They're, they're just wacky styles to where it's like, you know, Anderson Silva esque, but it has their own flair to it. Um, oh. And I think those type of, type of styles really are successful because at the end of the day, you're just standing here across from another man in a combat sport, right? And when people start doing very unorthodox things, you know, you're not going to have a cool head. I mean, unless you're George St. Pierre who's had, you know, years and years and years of experience, you're going to get a little bit overwhelmed in there for sure. And Paul Daly is experienced, but he also has his fair share of losses. So I think coming into this fight, looking at MVP, who is he undefeated as well, I believe? Yeah, I believe he is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you come in against an undefeated guy like that, and yeah, Paul Davis has 16 losses to his name. It's it's a little it's a little iffy. Um, so you know we'll see. Again, this is MVP's uh, huge milestone test in his career right now. Uh, so there's a lot riding on this. If he loses this fight, a lot of his flair kind of goes out the window for fans. But if he wins this fight, that's a huge step towards you know a Bellator title shot. And hopefully, we eventually see him in the UFC. Um, you know, I'm all about cross MMA platforms getting huge, but um, yeah. if MVP really develops into one of the best welterweights in the world, I'd love to see him compete against the best in the world at, at uh, the UFC. Yeah, I was, I, that's something I wanted to ask you, too, because I, I had a chance to attend um, PFL's final card um, on December 31st on E Z, which is a fantastic card for the year. Um, and I asked um, Carlos Silva as well as Ray Seppo their thoughts on, you know, cross-branding and having their champion fight the top champion in, in the other um, MMA fashion companies, I should say, against like the likes of um, what's with TNT and Bellator or, or a middleweight champion in the UFC, you know, things like that. But they, and, and they, off, off camera, they, you know, kind of mentioned that it was, um, it's a good idea, it's just hard to make, you know. I guess it's a business yeah. situation-wise. Yeah, yeah, those, you know, those, I, you know, that's kind of like a fantasy thing to a lot of fans, right? You know, there's there's guys in Bellator that are the best in the world. And there's guys in UFC that are the best in the world. So it's like, I really want to see these guys fight. However, I don't think we'll ever see the UFC cross-platform with any other promotion. I just don't think. The UFC tries to put themselves so far ahead of their competition, I don't think they'll ever revert back to saying, oh, Bellator does have one of the best lightweights in the world, so let's put him, let's put Khabib against Michael Chandler, right? You're not going to see that. Would it be a great fight? Yeah. I think that would be very interesting, but I don't think it's in the realm of possibility for the UFC. Um, <clears throat> now, if you're talking to, about one championship in Bellator, maybe. Maybe those smaller promotions can, you know, kind of mix together and put on something like that. Um, like I said, like I said before, um, a few episodes ago, before we took you know our season break, I, I think to really pinch at the UFC, it's not. It takes you know multiple multiple promotions, not just one, to kind of pick at the UFC and take their uh, talent away. I guess in a sense. Um, but we've seen it. You know, Bellator's grown. The PFL did tremendous in this season, and we see it in one championship getting Sage Northcutt. 
Eddie Alvarez and Demetrius Johnson. So those are huge pickups. Similar to boxing, um, with all the different promotion companies in boxing, top rank boxing, uh, matchroom boxing, um, premier boxing champions, we see a lot of we see a lot of like you just mentioned the top talents in each in each promoters camp. These fights are hard to make because you know promoters are fighting on different networks. As you know, matchroom boxing is with the zone. Top rank has just made a great deal. They have a fight coming on. Um, well, they have they made a great deal with a natural boxing fighter. So it's like you know, promoters trying to get the get the best to fight the best. But it is kind of difficult when you ha- you have your own brand and you have your fighters, and you know you don't want your fighter to lose. You want your fighter to win as much as they want. But like the fan, like you just mentioned, the fans want the best to fight the best. You know, and, and as I look yeah. at the, the current state of boxing right now, it's similar to the question I just opposed to you because. We have, for instance, we, we've had a, um, this past week in boxing, there's been, it's been a lot of things taking place. We have the Canelo Jacobs, I mean, Canelo Alvarez and Danny Jacobs fight finally announced. Both fighters are on matchroom boxing and on the zone. And when you look at the aspect of the middleweight division, matchroom boxing and the zone has the middleweight division on lock because they had all the champions signed, signed to their promotional brand, to their, you know, to their company, you know. Um, Demetrius Andre, who just made the first defense of his middleweight title, the WBO middleweight championship this past Friday at the Hula Theater. And then Daniel Jacobs is the IBF middleweight champion, and Canelo is the WBA and WBC middleweight champion. So it's going to be tough for any top middleweight and any other promotion team to get a shot at these guys unless they sign with the zone on matchroom boxing, as per what Eddie Hearn um, has, has said or mentioned several times in previous interviews. Uh, but, you know, the past week of boxing has been very interesting. We have an um, upcoming announcement, hopefully next week, regarding Anthony Joshua's big USA debut. Because supposedly he will be taking on uh, big baby Jerrell Miller, undefeated as a title contender from Brooklyn. Um, they're looking at possibly making that fight for some time in June, and it'll definitely be shown on that. It'll be promoted through Matchroom Boxing and Selena Promotions and Greg Cohen Promotions, and it'll be taking place hopefully in Madison Square Garden. Um, that's a huge fight in the heavyweight division. As we all know, the likes of Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, and Billy White are there, but obviously those fights couldn't be made. Those contracts were offered, but I guess it wasn't to their liking. So the next step for Anthony Joshua to make his big USA debut is to take on a big USA undefeated fight, and they, they made me know it. I think that's a great fight. Um, like I just mentioned, De- De- Demetrius Andre, he just – Made the first defense of his own world championship title. He was successful, 12 round TKO stoppage. Um, and then Amanda Serrano, who fought on the same card, she became the first female fighter in boxing in history to become a seven division world champion. Had to also Amanda Serrano, her entire team. We had a, another huge announcement made with Terrence Crawford taking on Amir Khan, taking place on April 20th. They're looking for the venue now. Hopefully, it comes to Madison Square Garden. Oh, the fight with Jacobs and Canelo is going to be in Vegas. Hopefully, we can keep Terrence Crawford and the man called in Madison Square Garden. That's a huge fight in the welterweight division. Um, as you know, we, other, we we also have other welterweight champions in the mix. Keith Thurman making his comeback fight. He's fighting this Saturday at the Barclays Center against Jose Cito Lopez. He's making a defense of his WBA Super. Well, his, his WBA welterweight championship, but it's the Super welterweight championship in the 147 pound division because Manny Pacquiao, he has the WBA regular um, title at welterweight. He just made a defense of it yesterday by defeating Adrian Broner. So it's a, it's a lot of good things taking place from Boston. Um, yesterday's fight, I'm going to just go right into it. Yesterday's fight was, was hey, it is what it is. I really was looking for Adrian Broner to, to do something different in this fight. I felt like he boxed okay. I felt like there were some things he definitely could have did more, just like a lot of other people who are in agreement with me. I think he, he fought well from the outside. He didn't apply any pressure, um, which I wanted him to do, which a lot of everybody wanted him to do. People wanted him to throw more punches. I think Adrian Broner just boxed well from the outside and didn't take any chances against a, a still strong, fast-spirited Manny Pacquiao. I think Manny Pacquiao put on a phenomenal show. He showed that at 40 years old, he could still move around. 
He can still do what he needs to do inside the ring to get, to get that W. And um, he's still a dangerous fighter, in my opinion. Um, but given the, given the style of his opponent will determine as to whether or not we'll see Manny Pacquiao score a knockout against anyone else. I think right now in the welterweight division, there's some guys that he can definitely beat. There's some guys that he can definitely, you know, look like the old Manny Pacquiao and knock out. I don't think he could beat the top of the top of the division, you know, the likes of a Terrence Crawford, a Errol Spence, a Mikey Garcia, a Sean Porter, a Keith Thurman. Um, I think he would have a lot of problems with those guys, not only because of their youth, but because of their styles. It would be good matchups. It would be good fights. But I think Manny Pacquiao will lose to every one of the guys I just mentioned. But nonetheless, hats off to him. They're, hope, they're looking at a possible rematch fight against Paul, uh, Floyd Mayweather. I personally don't want to see a rematch fight with Floyd Mayweather. Oh, no. It'll probably be the same. I, you know, I really don't. I think it will be the same type of fight we had previously. Absolutely. I think and if, it ain't, if it doesn't become the same type of fight we had previously, I think the Manny Pacquiao may just come out and win this fight. But me personally, I don't want to see a rematch fight with um, – Manny Pacquiao for Floyd Mayweather. I think Manny should move on and fight the best of the best in this division. He signed with Premier Boxing Champions with his own promotion with Team Manny Pacquiao promotion. So he has about three more fights left in his contract. He he can rightfully so fight whoever he needs to fight. I don't want to see him pursue Floyd Mayweather. I think pursuing Floyd Mayweather just it just it just kind of makes the clock go out a little longer. <laughs> in my opinion, you know, just leave it where you know, just leave it in the past. Leave it where it's at, man. Focus. Your legacy is already intact. Focus on expanding it even more. Fighting for me, whether it's not going to expand you. Fighting for me, whether again, in my opinion, is not going to expand your legacy. But nonetheless, we have some good. Uh, we have some good fights coming up. Like I just mentioned, Keith Thurman is fighting um, on this this upcoming Saturday. Um, Sean Porter, Ugas, um, Ugas is fighting in March. For the WBC, is it February or March? I'm not sure. But I know they have an upcoming fight for the WBC welterweight champion, Sean Porter, making the first defense of his title. We have um, Javante Davis taking on Abner Mares. They're fighting um, in February. Javante Davis is going to be defending his WBA super featherweight title. Hopefully he you know, pulls out and gets the victory of that. Everybody is hoping that we can get a unification fight between Javante Davis against Kevin Farmer, and see that's the issue that I was talking about earlier with the different with the different promotion teams and the companies and, and the networks because Javante Davis fights on Showtime and Kevin Farmer fights on the zone with matching boxing, so it's, it's going to be different to make certain certain fights um, take place that the fans want in boxing. However, boxing is really really starting to shape up and putting on other good fights that people have been clamoring for especially with the Mikey Garcia and Errol Spence fight, which is going to be a phenomenal fight. My personal prediction, my personal opinion, I think Errol Spence is a fantastic fighter. I think he's strong. Um, Southpaw, one of the best welterweights in the game. I don't think he has enough championship experience, boxing ring ring intelligence, to defeat Mikey Garcia. However, his skills, per se, can you know, he has the skills to beat him. I just don't think he has the mental the mental focus to do it. I think Mikey Garcia finds a way to, to pull out a, uh, either a split decision or a unanimous decision. My opinion, I've been telling people this for a while. I've been getting yelled at, cursed at, criticized. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I'm, I, oh, I yeah. like going for the underdog. You know me. I don't care. <laughs> That's just my thing. But hey, there's a lot. There's a lot of good fights coming up, man. I'm I'm excited for the for both sports between MMA as well as boxing. We got a lot of good content coming our way. Oh, yeah. A lot of things that we can you know talk about for for, for hours and hours and hours. And I'm yeah, really yeah. I'm really really excited for what's taking place within the, for this year within both sports of MMA and boxing. Oh, this is, this year is going to be great, X, for both sports. I can already tell. Um, you know, last year was kind of a lackluster year for combat sports, in my opinion. Um, too much controversy in, in in both aspects. So, I think this year uh, it's going to be a great year for both sports, and I'm excited to see uh, where we at or where we're where we're at in about um, you know five six months with these sports and what kind of fights we're going to be yeah. viewing. Absolutely, absolutely. So on that note, 
I would like to say thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We are back yeah. live in effect, Shoot the Five, on myself and Pat, myself, Xavier Porter, and co-host Pat DeMoss. Uh, we took a little break to put some things in perspective. We're talking to some people. We got a lot of good things that's going to be taking place this year with uh, the Shoot the Five podcast. Uh, special shout-out to our guy, Nat Wilkins, who's in the cut. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> hanging out with us today. Hang, he hangs out with us all the time. Um, there's some good things taking place in Cali. That will be providing some information um, and, and coverage on that. You know, as we progress with the podcast, but definitely, you know, tune in, hit us up. Make sure you drop your likes and your comments um, and, and on on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. Make sure you hit the like and the subscribe buttons. Hit the notification buttons and leave your comments and let's you know continue the dialogue and let's continue to just share share the sport and discuss everything that we really appreciate about it. All right. Pat, any last words? Yeah. Uh excited to be back on the podcast with the X and uh looking forward to next week's episode. All right, stay tuned. Super five in the building.